Good evening. You all ready to be here? I am Rebecca Hale. I'm one of the founders of the Colorado Springs Freethinkers and president of the American Humanist Association. Thank you. Now I know where my fan club is, thanks. Both of those organizations are among the sponsors of this evening's program, and I am pleased to welcome you here tonight. I'd also like to thank Bruce Coriel and the Colorado College community for their expert and gracious support of tonight's program. There are, yeah, let's applaud them. This evening, we will be exploring the climate and programming of the Child Evangelism's Fellowship's Good News Clubs and how they are entrenching themselves in America's public schools. Last year, I received an email from a friend saying, hey, look at this YouTube video. Do you know anything about this? I didn't know. So I set off to find out more and bring the expert who wrote the book to Colorado Springs. That expert is Catherine Stewart, an author of articles the likes of The Guardian, The New York Times, Reuters, Bloomberg, and Rolling Stone, and books including The Good News Club, The Christian Right's Stealth Assault on America's Children. It is this book that brought her to my attention and to us this evening. Although the journey to tonight started with Catherine and that email, it didn't end there. A few months later, I received an email from a fellow who said he thought I might be interested in his religious journey. Eric Cernyar is an attorney here in Colorado and was raised with the strict adherence to the Good News Club's teachings. I met with Eric and thought, well, now this is interesting. And then a very exciting piece of the puzzle arrived with a comment from Catherine. We were chatting one night on the phone, and she said, would you mind if Richard Dawkins spoke with me? <laughs> Let's be clear, Richard Dawkins is the preeminent English evolutionary biologist, and until 2008, the University of Oxford's Professor for Public Understanding of Science. Professor Dawkins is a rock star in the secular, non-theistic movement across the planet. He and his Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science are a powerful moving force, swooping in to inspire and to motivate. I could go on and list his many accomplishments, his books, his articles, his videos, but honestly, you can find all of that on Wiki. What I can tell you is that he is a kind and caring man. And he has enthusiastically and graciously jumped into the fray. He is doing so much by adding his influence and his reputation to bring the spotlight to this draconian form of religious indoctrination and bullying. And we thank him for that. Also on the stage tonight is Sean Faircloth. Sean is the author of The Attack of the Theocrats, How the Religious Right Harms Us All and What We Can Do About It. Faircloth is an attorney and served 10 years in the Maine legislature. He is no stranger to the tactics of the extreme evangelical movements. Sean will talk with us about the Medusa head of this far-right evangelical movement with a brief glimpse of their areas of involvement, and most importantly, what we can all do to preserve religious freedom in this country. I am so very proud to turn this stage over to Ms. Catherine Stewart. So much, Becky. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm so grateful for all the support that I've received from 
Becky Hale and the um, American Humanist Association, from the Richard Dawkins Foundation and all the other partners, and uh, for their assistance in bringing um, good uh, news about the Good News Club to light. Um, before we start talking about good news clubs, I want to share some good news from the recent election. I think we should celebrate that in some states, same-sex marriage and marijuana were legalized in the same day. And this makes biblical sense because, as it says in Leviticus 2013, a man who sleeps with another man should be stoned. <laughs> And now, for some really interesting good news. It's no surprise to me, of course, that this issue is of interest to people like Richard Dawkins, a lifelong defender of science education, and uh, those recovering from fundamentalism, such as Eric Cernyar. Uh, but I think it should also be of concern to parents, educators, and indeed anyone who cares about the future of our country as a modern, secular democracy. I want to tell you a little bit about what got me here. I didn't go looking for this issue to write about. It came to me, and it started with one of those events that at first seemed so small, you scarcely notice it, until suddenly you're in a new world. Four years ago, I was living in sunny Santa Barbara, California, with my husband, our six-year-old girl, and our baby boy. I don't know, have any of you seen that Saturday Night Live skit, The Californians? That was my life. I mean, it was, uh, it's, uh, I, I, at the time I had a job at a glossy magazine, and I was obsessed with Pilates, Pinot Noir, and the off-ramp to the 101. But um, then one day, I heard that a good news club was coming to our daughter's public elementary school. Now, what could possibly be wrong with a group calling itself the Good News Club? Uh, it turned out that they were Bible study, um, but the program required parental permission, so I thought, no big deal. I'm a big free speech advocate, and I also happen to think that the Bible is worth studying, even in public schools from a historical or a literary standpoint. But I started to hear stories from parents who sent their kids to schools in town where good news clubs had recently been established. And I started to hear about how the clubs were turning five- and six-year-old kids into faith-based bullies. A little girl named Zoe got into an argument on the playground with Ashley, who had just started attending a good news club. The teacher tried to break it up, ex explaining that different religions have perspectives on different issues, different perspectives. Now, Zoe was fine with this, but the little girl attending the good news club, Ashley, she was devastated, and she, she burst into tears. How can that be? It must be true, because they taught it to me in school, she cried. I know um, they don't lie to us in school. Um, they don't teach things in school that aren't true. How can they lie to us in school? Uh, this story gets to the heart of the trouble with good news clubs. I don't have a problem with kids talking about their religion with their friends at school, if any, religion, if any, or for their perspectives on religious issues, but I do have a problem with kids being deceived into thinking that their school favors a particular religion and kids being encouraged to use that fraudulent information to try to convert and bully their peers. Now that misperception on the part of these kids is no accident. The Good News Clubs use the school's cloak of authority to indoctrinate children as young as five years old to a deeply fundamentalist form of evangelical Christianity by giving them the false but unavoidable impression that the school endorses a particular form of the Christian faith. Now, there was a funny thing about the arrival of a good news club in our uh, public school. It appeared that nobody in the parent body had invited them, them in. And not only that, there was no shortage of Bible study in the neighborhood already. Uh, in fact, the school was right next door to an evangelical church, and um, many of the parents worked in an evangelical college that was right up the road. So a group of parents met with the good news club leaders and offered them free space, free space in an evangelical uh, church literally next door to the school. But the leaders of the Good News Club adamantly refused. They desperately wanted to be in the school. So I started to ask questions. Why do they need to put their religious program in our public school? Who were these people uh, who uh, were behind the Good News Club and what did they really believe? Is what they were doing legal and consistent with the constitutional principle of the separation of church and state? 
I spent four years researching the topic. I attended Good News Clubs in different public schools and talked to their leadership. I went to a Good News, uh, Good News Club training sessions, joined a mission project in uh, Boston, and um, attended a national convention by their backers in Alabama. So I have some answers about the Good News Club. The first question is, what is the religion of the Good News Club? Well, it turns out that it's not just any old kind of Christianity. Let me give you an example. Here is the second weekly lesson in a standardized series of lessons um, of the Good News Club. I should add that all these lessons are highly scripted. Um, the instructors are given a plan of what to say that covers a 60-minute class, minute by minute. There's no room for spontaneous interpretations and absolutely no room to deviate from the party line. Now, some of you may be familiar with the story of the Amalekites in the first book of Samuel. The Israelites are having some trouble with their neighbors, the Amalekites, and God orders Saul to exterminate them all, including the children and the babies. Saul does his best to carry out the deed. He kills the women, the children, the babies, and most of the livestock, but he spares the king. According to the scripture, God is outraged by Saul's failure to execute the order in full. And this is an interesting and challenging story, and I'm sure it can be interpreted in many different ways by different biblical scholars, but I do want to note that it has a history of showing up when one sectarian group has set its sights on exterminating its rivals, Rwanda and Northern Ireland being just two of the many examples. But the relevant, relevant point here is that the Good News Club that thinks that this is a story that should be brought to the attention of five and six-year-old children in public schools. And the lesson the Good News Club wants to teach is quite clear. If God gives you the order to kill everybody, you must do it to the letter, or you are committing the sin of disobedience. Here the manual specifies... The teachers are actually instructed to say to the kids, if only Saul had asked God for the strength to obey completely. And in three separate places in the curriculum, oh, by the way, the Amalekites are, are to be killed because um, they refuse to believe in God because of their sinful unbelief caused them to do wicked things. In three separate places in the curriculum, it says, teaching statement, have the children shout, God will help you obey. And here again, Teaching statement, have the children shout, God will help you obey. And again, same thing down here. Have the children shout, God will help you obey. So um, with a fundamentalism this deep and an emphasis on obedience at all costs, it is perhaps no surprise that the keynote speakers at the National Convention uh, of the Child Evangelism Fellowship rant against the so-called homosexual agenda promote creationism, which is in fact taught in some good news, in a Good News Club lesson, and expressed hostility toward public education as an institution because it fails to affirm them in their sectarian beliefs. One keynote speaker at the convention said, when they removed Jesus as the foundation of public education, what was once for the good became a consequence of evil. Another keynote speaker at that convention was uh, lecture. He was a keynote speaker who was promoting a book that he co-wrote with Ken Ham. I don't know if any of you know who that is. I brought a copy of that book here. It's called Darwin's uh, Evolution's Racist Roost, Roots, Darwin's Plantation. And Ken Ham is this uh, leader of a creationist outfit. And that book, by the way, condemned interfaith marriage, which the author, author referred to as interracial marriage. As I learned more about the culture of the Good News Club, and the CEF, that's the Child Evangelism Fellowship. Now something kept nagging me. These groups create division among formerly friendly neighbors. I saw this happen in my own community. But perversely, the Good News Club leaders often seem thrilled about that strife. They seem to operate with a kind of indifference to the school community, or even a hostility toward it. The religious right wing often claims to promote small town values and act as though they are the last defenders of the American family. But division among neighbors is not, to my mind, a small town value. At the CEF's national convention, I heard members of the organization talk about breaking down the doors of the public schools. Um, some spoke about kicking in the doors. At a seminar on securing permission to enter the schools, good news clubs that met with resistance from school communities or administrators were urged to sue. They were given an 800 number and offered free legal representation. 
We're in a battle with Satan, said Matt Staver, the founder and leader of Liberty Council and a keynote speaker at their national convention. Satan is a strategist of war. What I finally came to understand is that the people in the movement, or at least the people behind the movement, would actually be happy to see the public schools fail. They think public education is evil. Public education in its current non-religious form is satanic. When Staver describes public schools, he says, tanks are there on the playground. Bullets are being hurled over kids' heads. The mushroom clouds are billowing. Now, it's hard for me to square Staver's visions with uh, my experiences of the places that my kids learn their times tables and memorize state capitals. But for such extremists, if you have to destroy the community in order to save it, that seems to be a pretty good deal. Their philosophy seems to be, if you can't own it, break it. Now, here's another troubling feature of the Good News Clubs, and my second point. The leaders of the Good News Clubs and the Child Evangelism Fellowship rely on deceit. Convincing five- and six-year-old kids that their religion is affiliated with and sanctioned by the schools isn't just a byproduct of their activity. It is part of a conscious program. They know very well that five-year-olds can't distinguish between what they learn. They can't make a distinction between what they learn from their teachers in school during the school day and what they learn from teachers at that same school and sometimes even in that same classroom after hours. Good News Clubs have employed any number of tactics to reinforce that false impression among the kids in Santa Barbara as in many, many other places. Uh, a Good News Club uses a member of the school's own teaching staff to teach a Good News Club. In Seattle, a Good News Club teacher volunteered uh, in the classroom uh, during the day so that kids would think she was a part of the school. She's a, an adult in the school, and they would think, wow, she must be part of the school. Um, a Colorado father said that the club put up posters in the school hallways. That happens all over the country as well. And a mother in Valencia, California, told me recently that the Good News Club teacher enters her child's kindergarten classroom to set up before the bell rings and actually does a roll call, effectively um, segregating the children by uh, uh, religious affiliation. All of these things are designed to make little kids think that the club is part of their school. Another level of deceit has to do with how they represent their beliefs. They systematically make an effort to present themselves as broadly Christian with these non-threatening labels like non-denominational and interdenominational. In fact, such labels just serve as um, effective marketing tools. The activists that I met who work for Good News Clubs believe that most Americans who call themselves Christians really aren't, including U.S. Episcopalians, United Methodists, Catholics. The list goes on. And of course, they categorically reject the legitimacy of all other faiths. And free thinkers and humanists, of course, are enemy number one. Now, the deceit doesn't end there. They also make an effort to misrepresent their beliefs to the parents who send their kids to the club. I attended a workshop in which one of the leaders of CEF's Spanish ministries explained to a room full of Good News Club teachers how they should phrase their introductions and lesson plans so as not to alert Catholic parents that the real aim of the club is to convert their children to the only true religion, their religion, and save those children of Catholic families from an eternity in hell. They also practice deceit in advertising. In Woodward, Pennsylvania, Timothy Havner's seven-year-old brought home a flyer a few weeks ago that said nothing about the kind of religion of Good News Club uh, the Good News Club was going to be teaching. Instead, it offered kids prizes, balloons, and yummy snacks, and promised the parents that the club teaches kids how to behave. We work hard to help your children make choices that will help them succeed in life, is what the flyer said. And at the bottom of the flyer, in all capital letters, it said... If your child cannot attend the club, please call the school. Now, this deceptiveness of this seeming opt-out clause is astonishing. It's designed to make uh, parents feel intimidated and believe that the school either requires or strongly favors this, um, this, this kind of club, or it seems intended to do that. <clears throat> A third thing that I discovered about Good News Clubs 
is that um, they reflect a significant shift in the focus of the evangelical missionary world. In the course of my research, I attended conferences uh, for evangelical missionaries. It used to be about converting poor countries or unreached parts of the globe, and they called that the 1040 window, based on the idea that um, uh, the countries that were the most unchurched were located between 10 and 40 north latitude, and if you look on the globe, you know, thousands of missionaries were dispatched to Africa and Asia and those areas between 10 and 40 north latitude. So today, the new thinking in the missionary world is that your targets must be young people, very young people, kids. Now here's another quote from Matt Staver. Anyone who studies warfare knows you focus on the most strategic part of the human chain link if you're trying to direct the largest cruise ship in the world. You focus on the one tiny thing in the cabin there that will ultimately change the rudder to change the entire cruise ship's direction. You focus on the youth. It is the most strategic age group we have. So in the missionary world right now, it's not geography that matters, it's age. One high-level missionary strategist, Louise Bush, who in fact, he's the one who coined that term 1040 window uh, some time ago, uh, he noted that 85% of all conversions to Christianity occur between the ages of 4 and 14. And he came up with this new idea, the uh, 414 window. I actually brought a copy of his book here to show you. This is his book. 4 and 14 refers to the ages between 4 and 14. And this has become a seminal text in the world of evangelical mission strategy. As sort of big picture thinkers in the evangelical world um, really uh, have paid, uh, uh, you know, given enormous credence to this idea. Uh, and it's given strategic direction to the entire mission, uh, evangelical world of uh, mission. So here's a quote from the introduction to the book. He says, even the Taliban places great emphasis on recruiting children. Um, political movements like Nazism and communism trained legions of children with the goal of carrying their agendas beyond the lifetimes of their founders. Um, world religions have done the same with systematic indoctrination of their young, even the Taliban. Then he, it concludes with the, the rallying cry, may God inspire you to join us in his battle for the little ones. The fourth thing that I learned is that the Good News Club is really a product of aggressive legal advocacy that is now enshrined in a crucial Supreme Court decision. Let me tell you about it. In 2001, the Supreme Court ruled in a case called Good News Club versus Milford Central School. The court held that religion is nothing more than speech from a certain point of view, and therefore these religious activities are protected by the free speech clause of the First Amendment. In that decision, the courts pushed free speech so far that the Establishment Clause, which, which prohibits government endorsing or funding of an establishment of religion, has been eviscerated. The Supreme Court opened the doors, and now programs like the Good News Club are using public schools as what they refer to as their mission fields. Now, this is a dramatic reversal of the basic principles that guided the Supreme Court, on church school issues for most of the 20th century. You see, until 2000 and, and that 2001 decision, the courts took seriously the coercive effect of school authority on small children, and they understood that the separation of church and state means that schools should be uninvolved with religion, neither favoring nor disfavoring any particular form of religion. Now, since that 2001 Supreme Court ruling, um, the theory is that as long as every religion gets a crack at the, lo the littlest kids, um, then it's okay. And who cares about the children or the educational mission of the school? Now, I want everyone, religious or non-religious, to have their freedoms rec recognized. So is religion nothing more than speech, like any other form of speech? Well, not according to our legal system. Our legal system treats religion very differently than other forms of speech. Religions have protections that other groups simply do not have. They get significant tax privileges. Uh, Reuters estimated that over the last 10 years, it's been, uh, it's been to the tune of $145 billion. Um, they get all sorts of exemptions from the law. They are, for instance, exempt from uh, anti -discrimination, uh, employment anti-discrimination laws, and they're allowed to engage in the kind of discriminatory practices and policies 
that would rightly get other non-religious groups excluded from campuses and government institutions. And they are allowed to tell little children that they are sinners and that they, quote, deserve to die, which is uh, what the Good News Club actually preaches. Now, these special privileges, according to religion, are why religion should be kept separate from government institutions like public schools. This is why the framers of the Constitution put the Establishment and the Free Exercises cl Clauses together as the very first clause in our First Amendment, the Religion Clause, which is separate and distinct from the Free Speech Clause. You see, religions can't have it both ways. If religion is religion, they get to have all these government handouts and exemptions from the law, but they must be kept clear of government institutions. And if religion is just speech, as they argued in that 2001 decision, then they have to be consistent about the benefits they are accorded, or we are favoring them over other forms of speech. If religion is just speech, it should be subject to the same kind of laws and policy restrictions and regulations that govern other forms of speech. As the situation presently stands, they define it as speech when they want to be protected from discrimination, but they call it religion when they want to be exempted from the law. The religious right is trying to have it both ways. Now, how did we get here? A part of the story that you know is that a number of conservative justices were appointed to the Supreme Court. The part of the story that you may not know was that this new judicial philosophy was bought and paid for by money coming from the radical end of the religious right. So who is behind this? The ADF, the ACLJ, Liberty Council? You may not have heard of them, but these organizations have combined budgets of over $100 million per year, and they have public schools in their sites. At present, there are nearly 4,000 Good News Clubs in public elementary schools around the country. Elementary schools, folks, that's K through five, K through six. That's the youngest kids here. But as problematic as this is, perhaps the most important thing I learned in all of my research is that the Good News Club is just one among dozens of similar programs that all have the same ultimate objective, to destroy public education as we know it. Now, public elementary schools are about education. And education is not anything goes. It is about teaching little children a set of facts and skills so that they have a chance at a brighter future. The Good News Club and its friends have little respect for these worthy goals. Their coordinated initiatives create precisely those ills against which the separation of church and state was intended to defend. The separation of church and state is a way to bring peace to societies that are inherently pluralistic. But the Good News Club and friends so division. Separation of church and state is a way we ensure that education answers to evidence and reason, not dogma and superstition. But the Good News Club and its friends are helping to spread ignorance. The separation of church and state is a way of ensuring individual freedoms and that people have a right to participate in society without being forced to conform to any particular religious creed. But the Good News Club and friends are forcing us to support and fund their religion, and they want your kids to feel bad if they're not one of them. The separation of church and state is not a luxury of our system of government. It is the foundation of it. The Good News Club is part of a much larger movement in our midst that rejects, that sees a separation of church and, uh, and state as unintelligible. This movement rejects the values of inclusion and diversity upon which our nation was founded. In its effort to discourage the kind of critical thinking and rational discourse that inhibit the spread of religious radical extremism, it has set its sights on destroying the system of public education itself. And it is succeeding. Unless we confront that fact directly, we may well keep all of our rights, but lose the system of education that has long served as the silent pillar of our democracy. Thank you very much.
I'd like to introduce uh, Richard Dawkins. Thank you. Eric, Richard Dawkins, Eric Cernyar. Voici l'anglais avec son sang froid habituel. Here is the Englishman with his habitual bloody cold. <laughs> I have to apologize uh, for my voice and my general air of ill health. Um, I w want to begin by mentioning somebody else who uh, has very largely w was responsible for organizing this event. Um, Elizabeth Cornwell, the executive director of the Richard Dawkins Foundation, um, had an enormous amount to do with organizing this. Uh, and um, I would like to express my appreciation to her. Um, um, well, it's my pleasure to introduce Eric Cernia and to um, uh, talk to him about uh, the Good News Club and the pernicious influence it's having. Um, my impression listening to Catherine was that um, this is a shocking matter. It's, it's quite horrible. I, I feel passionately about the way uh, children are treated by these uh, religious fundamentalists. And one of the things I would like to know is if the facts, as Catherine was laying them out, became generally known, would that be enough to condemn the Good News Club in the eyes of the American people? Or would they actually rejoice and say, yes, that's what we want? I mean, is, is it enough simply to expose what's going on? Or I, is that not enough? It may be enough, because in the 2001 Supreme Court decision of a Milford versus, or Good News Club versus Milford Central School, the only issue that was presented to the court was whether the school um, could rightly exclude the Good News Club on the basis that it was religious. Uh, there was no discussion uh, in any kind of detail of the content. There was no discussion of, of the, um, uh, the shame and fear indoctrination that goes on or teaching children to be afraid to think. Uh, and there was no discussion of how you know, the curriculum actually encourages students to uh, show contempt for teachers who discuss evolution. Um, it characterizes uh, those people as uh, fools, servants of Satan, and servants of Satan who refuse to believe God. If that had been part of the factual basis or, or the factual development of the case, and had the school had some child protection provisions that uh, looked out for the emotional, psychological, and intellectual well-being of the children, then it's very likely that the outcome would have been different. Y you have to understand, the Supreme Court looked at it just like a lot of evangelicals look at it. Um, they just looked at it s simply as a matter of their beliefs being persecuted. And there was this false equivalence between um, religious viewpoints and non-religious viewpoints. But that equivalent starts to break down when you start to look at some of the severe authoritarian things they teach children. Well, Eric, I know you're a lawyer, and I think we might come back to that a little bit later, but could you tell us a little bit about your own personal involvement with the Good News Club? Um, yes. How you started becoming interested, and at what okay. age? Yes. Well, um, well, when I was uh, five years old, my mother invited Child Evangelism Fellowship to uh, host Good News Clubs during the summertime at our home. Where, where was that? Uh, this was Tacoma, Washington, which is one of the strongholds of Child Evangel uh, Evangelism Fellowship, which, by the way, has been in existence for 75 years. And in fact, the first Good News Club was held in 1923, so it goes way back. Uh, so we attended those. I also attended Good News Clubs for several years in other people's homes. And you were five. Right. And, and up until what, when? Uh, up until about the age of 10. Right. Yeah. And s some of the most vivid things that I remember um, learning about was in, in every single lesson, they would weave the story of, they, they call it the wordless book. But the part that I most vividly remembered was the big black heart. See, 
the big black heart represented who we are, our true real selves. From the time that we were born, we were born sinful and rebellious. And so, so we were born with a shameful condition. So we, we this learned of course to, to is, This, of course, is part of Christian doctrine. I mean, e even, even respectable Christians, um, even... <laughs> it's original sin, yes. Um, the, the idea that all humans, from their, the day they're born, yeah. are born in sin. Right. The sin inherited from Adam, who never existed. Right. But nevertheless, this is a fundamental plank of Christian theology. It, it every is. Every baby born in sin inherits, inherits the sin of Adam. Right. And needs to be purged of the sin of Adam. Right. Um, by accepting Jesus, otherwise you go, to, you go to hell. Now, that's part of Christian doctrine that, that, that comes from St. Paul. Right. But most Christian sects have kind of glossed over that a bit. Or they've abstracted away from it. And, and, yes. and they look at it as a general condition of humanity. Whereas Child Evangelism Fellowship, even their own instructional materials state that part of one of their chief um, goals is to um, get children to understand uh, their lostness without Christ. And they believe it needs to be very personal or it's not real. Now, does it actually frighten the children? Did it, did it frighten you to be told that you're a sinner and that you're in danger of going to hell? Um, a, a lot of children are very much affected by the fear. For me, it was the shame aspect that, effect, that affected me most because my own mother reiterated what the Good News Club taught. Um, she was influenced by them. And she told me that when I was five, that it, uh, if I uh, didn't accept Jesus into my heart, when I died, I would burn in hell forever. Now, well, I felt a tremendous where sense of guilt come from. Well, it was a tremendous sense of alienation because for my own mother, I, I'm her flesh and blood after all. For her to tell me that I was worthy of that um, was a, a very alienating thing. But, but you began by saying that it wasn't so much the fear as the guilt. And and the that shame, sounds right. pretty much like, yes, shame. That yeah. sounds pretty much like fear. You're, you, you were afraid of going to hell. Where did the shame come from? Did you actually think you were a well, sinner? Well, yes, I did. I mean, we were uh, told that all of the time. Um, and but told in such to personal say what your sins senses. Were. What, what had you right. actually done wrong? I mean, were you actually. Asked, <laughs> you asked yourself, what did I actually do wrong? Well, there were no sins of immorality when I was five. So. Um, <laughs> And that seems to be the big thing. But so, so for children in this age group, they'll talk about um, cheating, tattling, um, saying mean things to other people. And these are the kinds of sins that make you worthy of death. Yes, and what I'm trying to get at is whether it was those things that made you worthy of death or whether it was the inherited sin, the fact that all people are born in sin. It is both. And CEF's training materials emphasize both aspects of it. In fact, you get a certain number of points if you focus on that original sin part where you um, are deserving of death and hell simply because you were born as a human, and also you know, the fact that everybody sins. Can you tell us about your website, which, it, which I think is a very valuable resource? Um, yes, yes. I, I think it's very important that given the Milford decision that we have right now, and given that it's very unlikely that's going to change in the near future, that we confront the Good News Club on the basis that they are harming children. And our message should be that we want to protect children from this kind of harm. And I can tell you, I was harmed by it. And so I've created a website. It's intrinsicdignity.com. And I've also created a model facility use policy. Shall we wait for people to write that down in case of intrinsicdignity, all one word, yes. dot com. That's right. Intrinsicdignity.com. Thank you. And so my suggestion, and what we really need, is for parents of children uh, that are going to public schools to get involved with their school boards, contact their superintendents, and talk to them about these issues and encourage them to incorporate child protection provisions into their facility use policies. There are court cases that have upheld some uh, provisions that are very similar to these. And so this is a way that we can confront them. And this will do a lot of things because it'll force Child Evangelism Fellowship to defend 
the severe things that they teach children. And they don't want to do that because their whole marketing is that they're about teaching morals and character and teaching children to make good cho choices in life. But if they're confronted with some of the statements that are in their curriculum about how you deserve to die and you deserve hell and how it, you should ask God to, to help protect you from wrong beliefs, yeah, they teach that too. And proselytize other children. And proselytize other children. I think that that will have a, a significant impact. The other thing that you can do is, if there is a good news club in your school, sit in on one, sit in on one and and ha, ha, Christians always talk about lovingly confronting one another. So lovingly confront them with the severity of what they teach. And they're going to feel very uncomfortable. And you can look up what they teach. Right. On, on, your, on your website. Yes, you can go to intrinsic, yes. Stuff. Um, I, I want to come back to my first question because I wasn't mm -hmm. quite sure about the answer. Um, if you, if you do what Eric suggests and, and become active in your local group and talk to other parents and things like that, can we be sure that if you tell them what's going on, they will be shocked? That they will say, wow, I, didn't, I had no idea that was going on. Or how much can, do we have to fear that they'll say, well, of course, that's exactly right. Um, it, of course, they, the Good News Club should be. I mean, right. My, my guess is that, that most people simply don't know what's going on and it, would be it, shocked if they knew. And therefore, in a sense, our task is made easier because all we need to do right. is to expose it, is to tell people what's going on. And, That's and right. Partly by books like Catherine's, partly by websites like yours. But if, if, if there's a grassroots drive for everybody to talk to their local school board, talk to, to the parents and so on. Am, am, is my intuition right that in most parts of the United States it would be shocking to people if they knew what was going on? I think it would be shocking almost everywhere. In fact, so shocking because most of the Child Evangelism Fellowship teachers that I've communicated with deny that this stuff goes on until I point out chapter and verse where it is. And they, it, it, it is amazing, but they're they're so scripted about teaching things, and they've been indoctrinated for so long with the severity, and they've abstracted it all away in their own minds. So they teach it without, um, it, 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 this is what my mother-in-law says, and she taught from those materials for a while. She says it's just words. And so they become consciously detached from the severity of what they're teaching. So that's one reason why I think we need to confront the Good News Club teachers themselves. I think they'll be very discouraged to realize that it's that bad when if, if they're confronted that way because they, they learn to deny what they're saying. Yeah. Now what about, coming back to, you, to ask you a question as a lawyer, um, the constitutional separation of church and state, which in my understanding is very deeply embedded in the American DNA. Yeah. Um, is it sufficiently embedded? Would, would people be shocked to hear the stories that the Good News Club uses subterfuge in order to get under the radar and to appear after the school bell goes so that they're technically not violating the constitutional separation? Are people sufficiently reverent towards the constitutional separation that that would shock them? Or do they not understand the constitutional separation? You know, that's a good question. I, my own experience has been that um, younger generations aren't as um, built up in this tradition. And so when I talk with other, even secular people, quite often they see it from a speech uh, viewpoint discrimination point of view. Um, so I, it's going to take time. But, but here's, here's the big thing. You've seen... Um, you've seen Child Evangelism Fellowship um, get into the schools on the logic of religious neutrality. That means that if you have religiously neutral child protection provisions that protect children from abusive things and extremely divisive things, and it doesn't matter whether it's coming from Stalinist Marx, uh, a Stalinist Marxist point of view, a Nazi point of view, or a, fundam a fundamentalist viewpoint. Um, if, if, if it has these kinds of things that are going to 
potentially traumatized children, um, then it's out. It can't be in there. Now, what will happen here is that you will see groups like the Liberty Council argue that the courts can't even look at the curriculum under the ecclesiastical abstention doctrine. Basically, the separation of church and state would protect them from government scrutiny. They're probably going to make that argument, but that really would be having it both ways. What will happen eventually is if they feel threatened enough by the fact that they broke down the wall separating church and state, they're probably going to want to build it back themselves. But possibly the most powerful weapon of all is to expose the kinds of things they're actually teaching yes. the children. And I've been shocked to see some of the things on, on your website. I think you've got some materials here that you wanted to demonstrate. Um, yes, yes. Um, so we're going to do a couple of exercises where, and uh, the first page is the first exercise, and, and we're going to script it here. And, uh, well, uh, you're going to be the student. You're the, uh, you're the teacher. I'm the teacher. I'm the child. Okay, okay so I'm going to, um, this is one of the exercises that uh, they do at the Good News Club. So they, they, they pick a, a, a child, a young, innocent child that, that is just as young as Christopher. <laughs> and it says sin on it. Um, and my question uh, dear Richard, is what is sin? Sin is anything you think, say, or do that disobeys God's laws. Very good, Richard. All have sinned and deserve God's punishment for sin, which is death, separation from God forever. Some children try to deny their sin. They say that they never do wrong things. Now I'm going to ask a question for the, the entire audience. You're the other children. But is that true? No. There, there you go. So do you see Richard's sin? He may not think it's there, but God says it, and you can be sure that other people see it too. Thank you. <laughs> so you can take, well, you can, and there's one more exercise here. All right. I'm sure that's in there. So this is so, the instruction to the teacher. Yes, begins. yes. Okay, so um, there are two envelopes in this exercise, but for the uh, demonstration here, I'm just going to have one. Um, Richard, I've got something for you. You've earned this, just like you can earn what's in this envelope. Do you know what you've done? Sinned. <laughs> yes, you have, Richard. You've done something we've all done. You've sinned. Let's see what you've earned by sinning. Do I have to open it? Oh, you have to open it, yes. What, do I, what have I earned? <laughs> you have earned death, separation from God forever in a terrible place of punishment. Thank you. Well, Eric, thank you very much. This, this has been a terrible revelation, both what, what Catherine has told us reading her book and from your website and what you've told us today. Um, I hope that we will all um, go out and do something about this in this local area and in other local areas if you come from, di from different places. So thank you, Eric, very much. I'm now going to introduce Sean Faircloth. Um, Sean is, the, executive, sorry, Sean is the, the Director of Strategy and Policy of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, and he's going to talk about issues of secularism more generally. Thank you, Sean. You can hear me in back up, and up high. You can hear me all right up there. And uh, you're enjoying yourselves hearing about Richard suffering internal damnation. Uh, that's good. <laughs> Glad to know. Well, I'm going to, as we said, talk a little more generally about the values of our movement. And I want to tell you that usually, in all my jobs, including uh, with my, my book, 
I'm involved in the nitty gritty. Uh, that is collaborating with people like you, analyzing and working uh, specific pieces of legislation, working with people like you, organizing for causes. So I love to work with folks on the details of strategy and policy. But I'd like us together to take a step back and take stock of the ideals that inspire us. Yugen is a Japanese word. It means a profound, mysterious sense of the beauty of the universe. And it might be the world's, I don't know, second best sensation, shall we say? <laughs> Not referring to that. No. As wonderful as Yugen is, it's still not the most transcendent feeling that our species can achieve. There is a higher pleasure, a greater challenge, that can only be met by first facing the world as it is. In this world, a few feel chosen by God to use the real holy hand grenades of Antioch and pull the cord or guide the plane that annihilates themselves and innocent people in Baghdad, Pakistan, and in the towers. And a few more feel chosen by God to machete the other guy, the free thought blogger in Bangladesh, shoot the secular politician in Tunisia, blow up the post office in Oklahoma City. Thousands more feel chosen by God to embrace so-called faith healing, placing a cookie tray underneath their daughter's infected leg as the pus drains out. No doctors, please. We're chosen by God to hurt our child, and we have collaborated with politicians and persuaded politicians to pass laws that give us greater leeway to do so. Now, absolutely certainly, there are millions of very good, decent, honorable religious people. Yet, it is also true that there are millions who feel chosen by God, worse yet are taught so-called truth, that the gay person is mutated, the woman shall be regulated, the child indoctrinated, God's alleged in-group, so certain, so lustful, for their holy law, actual laws, imposed on us all. Some laws, from Mississippi to Maine, many laws, from Cairo, to Karachi. Meanwhile, Odin got a pink slip, even though he gets my vote for God, really. Yay, Mead! But <laughs> no laws in Odin's name, though, now. Pity poor Apollo, Ishtar, Quetzalcoatl, shuffling their feet in the unemployment line with Odin, Isis, and Axel Rose, or whoever. <laughs> but some of us doubt that simply because a god happens to be currently fashionable means that that god is any more reliable. Instead, we turn to people, people who question. Einstein, Voltaire, Jefferson. Now, reason, science, that wind blows wicked cold, we are warned, from the megachurch pulpit, from the mosques, from the House Science Committee. And yes, that wind does bite. Your call, says the doctor, turn off my mother's motherboard. Her hardware failed. Her software lit only by outside power. Pulling that plug, I saw no harps, no wings. White, yes, clinical white hospital walls, bone white cremation papers. We are all on the very same life raft on which my mother sank. Our children, we hope, our parents, we hope, might be lucky with loved ones to talk to on that life raft, but that life raft is leaking and there is no safe harbor. Facing this hard truth, reason and science lead us somewhere real and warm 200,000 years of humans only 400 years since Francis Bacon's book his treatise the new method 
the rigorous scientific method. A mere 400 years, 400 years out of 200,000, we are just limbering up. No more opposite sides of some mythological line, gay versus straight Muslim versus Hindu myth versus judgmental myth. Reason and science is a thread. We draw ourselves forward on that thread. And before you face white hospital walls, you face a white blank canvas. Paint, write, grow, bloom. So yes, love those children. Thank whoever's arm you can touch in bed. Yes, laugh. Yes, enjoy. Yes, be thankful. For 200,000 years, we're lucky to be here now. Human lifespan doubled. A wondrous time when science can fly if we draw ourselves forward on that bright th thread. Old lines in the sand disappear. Us versus them, old tribe. Our tribe, today's tribe, has Darwin's evolutionary thread, Dawkins' genetic thread. Now we know our thread runs all the way back to cousin bonobos, to fish, more family to me than some mega minister pounding that bully pulpit. Our new tribe views from space our globe entire. We use our brain, the best computer, creating the brightest colors. Van Gogh, the Sydney Opera House, the Apollo Mission, the Mayo Clinic, Abbey Road, so what's next? Not the shadows, not the mythical cul-de-sac. Stand up, shoulders back in the sun. Whatever is you happens just once. So bring yourself all the way out. Art, science, politics. Yes, politics. The politics of reason and science, of evidence and compassion. For no compassion is real, no compassion honest, unless we embrace evidence and modify our conclusions compassionately based upon that evidence. So yes, we work hard together. We make, however, of our politics a party, the office party of reason and science with drinks and making out in the supply closet. <laughs> stand up, stand up for reason and science. Tradition and dogma are bullies. We pursue the newest methods, the strongest solutions, the boldest plans, and we risk fun. <laughs> because, yes, it is scary. This is our one and only performance. Beyond even Yugen is the best feeling. Accomplish something, improve our world. That's our greatest possible joy. Unleashed from dogma, we dance a jig carefree along the cliff's edge of time. Proud our dance is never hesitant, never cringing, offered boldly, honestly, joyfully, and completely. So dig into the work, into the nitty gritty, into the politics of reason and science. For that dance, that effort, that cause is the most beautiful dance of all. Thank you very much. Oh, no. but, but now the next question is, what do we do about it? <laughs> because our ideals are only as good as our actions. And my book happens to offer a modest plan to take over the United States. And I'm hoping that you're with me. <laughs> so let's do this together. Because secularism, the values of secularism, the politics of reason and science must gain real traction, real influence in this society. Influence in politics, influence in our civic life, influence in culture. How do we achieve this? Well, and thanks to our executive director, uh, Dr. Cornwell, who brought everyone here uh, this evening, you see the action you can take locally 
in your school board, in your local community, and I strongly encourage every one of you to take this to heart and not simply say, interesting evening out, but rather it is time for action in my community. But there is also even more we can do. When I talk about secularism, having influence in politics, it's because we are going to see each other in Iowa. Together, all of us are going to change this country. And I'm going to see you in Iowa in 2015. About 35 years ago, there was an obscure, utterly unknown politician named Jimmy Carter who changed the nature of American politics through working through the caucus system in the state of Iowa. Some of you are aware of the crowd that was in, at the Reason Rally in Washington, D.C. a year ago. Well, I submit to you as a 10-year politician, that if we bring half of that crowd from Colorado, from Florida, from Washington State, from Maine, Oregon, and we bring them to the state of Iowa, where you have not very many people and more media than you've ever seen in your life in the year 2015, with a campaign to get religion out of government, and we build an alliance with liberal religious groups and secular people together, we can profoundly change the nature of this republic. And you can do that, and what better place to party than Iowa? So we are going to see all of you there. That's step one for increasing our influence, and we're going to plan together across the United States with the help of the Richard Dawkins Foundation to get this done. A next step is to have influence in civic life. The American Civil Liberties Union, they have chapters, the Colorado Civil Liberties Union. They have chapters in every single state of the union. We must have this civic influence. And with the help of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, we are going to be a catalyst with you and with your efforts so that in every single state of the union by the year 2020, there will be regular statewide free thought conventions at least every other year, if not every year. Because as much as we are honored to have Richard Dawkins with us here and he can draw crowds like this tonight, it's much more important that you have your local speakers, your local organizers that build that community of secularism and really start to influence civic life. We will work with you on this, and this will really change the visibility and understanding of where secularism is in American society over the next several years. Next is changing the view of us in culture. This is an actual view of the estate of Joyce Meyer, the number one female uh, fundamentalist minister in the United States. Many of you may not be aware of an IRS provision uh, called the Parsonage Exemption, but all of you in this room are helping to subsidize the homes of mega ministers. The big stars like Joyce Meyer are the tip of the iceberg. Below that are hundreds upon hundreds of ministers who use the Parsonage Exemption, take money from your pocket, enriching themselves for homes, and there is no upper limit on the value of the home for which they can gain tax exemption you are paying. With the help of our executive director, Dr. Elizabeth Cornwell, and Richard, we met with a young attorney uh, not long ago in Oregon, and she took over the task of coordinating a database. And we are going to crowdsource a database of ministers who exploit this with an extravagant lifestyle and contrast that in a documentary with the victims, the victims of religious prejudice in American law. Children's issues, in my book, I write about religious bias in health care for children, religious bias in child care for children, where children end up being harmed, faith healing laws in the vast majority of states where children end up being harmed. It is a significant section, the area where children are abused and one of the most horrific. Most of you are aware of areas of law of religious bias such as against women's reproductive choice or against gay people, but in this book we talk about seven additional areas that you can talk to your friends and neighbors about. But we're going to use this mechanism to show the people the victims of these problems and bring forward the cause of justice and civil rights for secularism. Next is we don't want to have this issue uh, within, because sometimes within secularism there has been a tendency to be a little bit too much of the white older male, all great. We love white older males, but we love everybody, and we want them in. And thanks to the leadership of our executive director, Dr. Cornwell, we are soon to unveil our Spanish language version 
of richarddawkins.net that's run by people who are Spanish speakers themselves. Because I am the first to recognize that it's different for me saying, well, hmm, this whole religious business, not for me. It's different, perhaps, if you are in the Latino community, if you are ex-Muslim. That situation is one where we need to provide a special outreach, and we will do this. Next is solidifying our infrastructure. Richard Dawkins has been tremendous in generosity in coming here, but with the social media, with richarddawkins.net, which gets about a million hits a month, our Facebook page, which gets about 300 people talking about it a week, we can organize together. And I can tell you, as a trifecta of lawyer, lobbyist, politician, that when politicians look at you and you come to their office, they look at numbers of dollars and numbers of pe people. And if we build this movement, we can transform American society for the better. This is the next great civil rights movement. And with secularism, the kind of abuse of children that we've talked about tonight can end. It is us, we secularists, who can be the leaders for the goal that the Greeks laid out to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of the world. I hope that you will be directly involved. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Lamont. Um, my question was sort of complex, so I wrote it down, but it's really quick. Um, uh, people fear what they don't understand, and people avoid what they fear. And so the religious people in America, by majority, don't understand science, and so they fear it, and so they avoid it. Um, my question is this. The religious are in the majority here in America, so how do you intend to improve science literacy by informing the majority that science will ruin the only thing they understand, which is faith. <laughs> well, yeah. Thank, thanks for the question. And everybody heard the question? Yeah. Um, first of all, I am perhaps surprisingly optimistic. When you look at the most recent polling, uh, the younger people are, the more embracing they are of secularism. I think the demographic trends are in our direction. And I think organizing is the key to kind of establishing that foothold that the religious right did establish 20, 30 years ago in American life. So we very much essentially need to do that. But I also would add that, and, and I actually read a survey, I can't quote the source, uh, but actually for posting something on the Facebook page, I read about this. They said some of the most popular uh, memes, discussions, articles that you uh, can put into social media are ones that have to do with the joy of science. That they really go viral dramatically, and I, I have found that myself, that there is, yes, there's an element of American society that's rejecting of science, but I, I sincerely believe that the majority of Americans, when they come down to it, like they had illustrated to them the Good News Club and saw what that was about, most of them are on our side. And furthermore, that the wonder of what NASA can do or, you know, when we start talking about mapping the human brain, that people find that beautiful because it is beautiful and poetic. And I think that part of our strategy is that we're the team that does celebrate that with great passion and sincerity and, and to bring that out and then to show the injustices as we've been discussing tonight. Catherine. I'd love to add to that. I think it's uh, defending public education uh, is really Im uh, important uh, in this area because science education is under attack. Uh, this year alone, since the start of 2013, I think it's either eight or ten bills have been introduced into different state legislatures uh, designed to uh, undermine not only the teaching of evolution, but the teaching of climate science and other aspects of science education. Uh, the same groups that are promoting uh, the undermining of science education are also promoting, uh, not coincidentally, uh, voucher, school vouchers, which will divert money away from public schools and send it to private religious schools, um, many of which teach creationism and, uh, and other kinds of um, unscientific principles. So I think it's, I think defending public education, supporting public education is, is very important uh, in this particular climate. I think that's good. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> 
First of all, I'd just like to thank you for um, coming and, I guess, talking about this issue. I think it's good uh, to expose things that are, that are going wrong in indoctrin indoctrination of children um, in ways that are manipulative, uh, like using psychology or just forcing them to do that. Um, so I, first of all, I want to thank you for doing that. I guess my question is, um, so the Good News Club, do you know if that is just a fringe group or a cult? Because uh, the people that I know <coughs> that are from more, I guess, historical traditions, like Orthodox, Catholic, Presbyterian, and a handful of others. Um, I know many of people from those traditions, and I haven't seen th that type of thing that we see, like, like you mentioned, on Joyce Meyer and on all the televangelists. I think there's a, a separation. So have you guys checked to see if those historical faiths um, are connected with this? Because from my, uh, from my knowledge, they're not. Do you want to? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start with that because I did a whole lot of uh, research on the history of Child Evangelism Fellowship because I experienced it as a child. Uh, it started in 1923, and, and it, that, remember World War I happened in the late 1900s, and, and that really traumatized the national psyche. And there was a really, there was a real strong reaction and a, and a, and a real buildup of fundamentalism in America in this time period. So CEF was, um, was born out of that fundamentalist resurgence. You know that in 1925 we had the Scopes trial. So it was right in that little time frame between the end of World War I and the Scopes trial. Well, CEF survived that um, and as, as did many other um, evangelical groups. They, they continued organizing and developing. It's really an evangelical group. Uh, mainstream uh, Christianity is not, or mainstream Protestantism, Catholicism, um, Eastern Orthodox have nothing to do with Child Evangelism Fellowship. But within the evangelical um, community, uh, CEF is, um, CEF's strongest base is Southern Baptists. Uh, Bible churches that, you know, don't have any affiliation, but, you know, really strongly emphasize the inerrancy of the Bible. Uh, and uh, a handful of other um, very conservative de denominations like um, uh, evangelical, evangelical Free Church of America. In fact, there was an endorsement by their, um, their leader of the Good News Club. So there is kind of a broad-based support, but it's from basically the biblical inerrantist camp, which is actually a significant portion of America's population. I would just add to that, that um, what we're seeing demographically in the United States is a rise of these evangelical groups to, and the suppression of your more traditional uh, religions, you know, the, the ones we grew up with when we were kids, or when I was a kid, not you, you're already a kid. Um, <laughs> but it, it um, so what we're seeing is that the membership in Catholic congregations is falling and Methodist is falling and, and all of those turn the other cheek kind of mainstream Christianity is losing ground against this um, draconian form of evangelical Christianity. Quickly, yeah. Quick follow up. Do you think, um, do you think some of those more historical, turn the other cheek, um, Christian traditions would uh, agree and join you in this? Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I, 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 when I pitched this to, the, um, to Bruce, to the chaplain's office here at CC, it wasn't because I was trying to pitch a let's tear down all religion kind of a program. What I, what I was looking at is there are so many fellow travelers out there at this particular cause. This is a place where we can have an intersection between the non-theistic community and our older, mainstream, more um, kinder and gentler Christianity or even Islam, Judaism, all of those, as long as we're not dealing with the draconian, um, child bullying kinds of intolerances. I think we can all be together in that. Thank you. Um, 
Thanks for coming today. Uh, my question would be, uh, so we've been talking more about fundamentalist groups in schools. Uh, my question is, what do you think of more progressive, uh, still religious, but more progressive uh, groups being in schools? And do you believe that we, are, are you optimistic that we can cooperate with them on uh, endorsing values such as gay marriage and uh, the like? I think when it comes to religion, thanks for uh, your question. It's about a progressive, what do we think of progressive, what do I think of progressive religious groups in the schools? I think when you're talking about religion in public schools, age matters. Uh, good news clubs focus on very little children um, and all of the programs are necessarily adult-led. Um, and now, if we're talking the middle and high school level, there are many religious programs and also secular student alliances in the public schools which are necessarily student-led, so they're um, not uh, officially endorsed or perceived as, hopefully, being, you know, perceived as being endorsed by the, the school. Um, and personally, I have no problem if um, uh, Christian athletes or... Uh, uh, Jewish soccer players or uh, secular students want to get together after school and uh, talk about their perspectives on uh, faith and um, do things like that. So I think, um, uh, you know, that's, I think you really have to make that distinction um, uh, when you're talking about religion in the public schools. Um, I guess the question of, um, you know, how would I feel about progressive religious groups in the public schools on, at the high school level? There, there are progressive religious groups um, at the high school level, but they're student-led groups um, uh, rather than adult-led groups targeting little kids as good news clubs are. Um, the problem with religion in public schools um, at the high school level, of course, is if these groups employ deceit uh, making uh, the kids think that their religion is somehow endorsed by the school or um, uh, employing a kind of coercion uh, uh, to make other kids feel like they have to join. For instance, if um, children start to feel uh, in student athletics that they need to pray to play, which is starting to happen, which has, is happening in a lot of high schools where a kind of athletic program will get completely taken over um, by a... a, a uh, kind of people who want to insert their, uh, you know, make prayers a normal part of the, a routine part of the practices and uh, sports activities and, and, and kids feel like they need to conform in order to actually participate in the game. That's when it becomes quite problematic. Can I add one point here? I think it's important to make a distinction between the idea of a marketplace of ideas versus an indoctrination camp. Uh, a lot of Supreme Court precedents talk about um, the importance of, of free speech and viewpoint neutrality um, in, because we have a marketplace of ideas. And they've even mentioned that you know, schools serve a function as being a marketplace of ideas, at least at the high school level. Now, as long as the students are ru running the marketplace, I think that's a great thing. And in fact, I will, I, I'll say this, in 11th grade, I started a Bible study club at my high school. And I think I should have had a right to do it because there was no outside direction. There was no school sponsorship. It was a club that my friend and I started. So it was, it's, this is, if it's a marketplace run by um, more mature students, I think that's great. But to try to port this concept of a marketplace of ideas to kindergartners, and they're not running the marketplace. Well, you've just turned that into an indoctrination camp. And I don't see how that really serves the principles behind the free speech clause of the First Amendment. Hi, I appreciate you for your time this evening coming out to talk to us. As someone with uh, a chemical engineering degree from Ivy League University, I love the talk of science. I love the emphasis on, uh, on rational knowledge. And uh, as, as someone of more scientific bent, uh, I'm very much interested in, in data and evidence and, and proof. And um, I, I, I felt like running through the entire theme of this talk this evening was an unspoken assumption that uh, merely the exposure to basic tenets of the Christian faith 
uh, amounted to child abuse. But as uh, Professor Dawkins so eloquently articulated, this has been part of the uh, heritage of Christianity, especially in the United States and around the world, for uh, millennia since its inception. The notion of original sin isn't something new to come on the scene, something that uh, the Bible Club has somehow invented. I mean, you can go to any evangelical Sunday school and probably hear something similar. So given this long uh, presence of this idea, um, I think it'll probably take a lot more than simply saying, oh, they're teaching Christian doctrine in schools to, uh, uh, to cause trouble for the good news clubs. My question is, uh, aside from the, the, uh, the rather atheistic assumption that mere exposure to these ideas is problematic, have you been able to come up with any other harms? Do you have evidence of poor test performances by students whose schools have good news clubs or psychological problems or other types of other negatives? Thanks for your question. Uh, you bring up the uh, issue of harms. Um, uh, you know, what harm does the Good News Club do? Um, I think beyond the harm done to individual students uh, by perhaps being inculcated in, uh, uh, you know, being targeted by their Good News Club attending peers for faith-based bigotry, uh, beyond the harm to any family that's going to start to feel disenfranchised because the school appears to endorse a particular form of religion. Um, uh, I think the greatest harm falls on the public school itself and on the institute, institution of public education. As I've seen over and over in my research, um, when a good news club enters a, a school community that has, a, you know, where the people have very diverse approaches to faith, um, then you know, people start to see the, the school subsidizing and promoting one particular form of, of religion, and they pull away. Um, many of them stop donating PTA, PTA, you know, money or time to the PTA. Um, they start to feel like the school occupies a less important place in, in, in the community. Um, you know, schools are, public schools are, are, are more than just bricks and mortar. They're, they're, places where we all come together, set aside our differences, um, and, uh, and support our children and their future. And uh, I think the greatest harm you know, uh, falls on, on the system of public education to begin with. Now, I, I also happen to think that the kind of religion that's taught in, in, in Good News Clubs is especially concerning. And uh, uh, you know, I, don't, I don't like to be in the role of judging someone else's religion. But if you don't want me to judge your religion, don't put it the one place that I am bound to see it, which is my kid's public school. Thank you. I wanted to add a point to that about uh, when you talk about the harm, in a lot of situations, uh, unless you're in one of the more liberal school districts, the real harm I see is a cultural harm within the community. The, what Madison called majority tyranny. I mean, and I would extend that even to teenage groups when the cheerleaders in the football team say, we're Christian and we want to have uh, Christian uh, quotations as the football team runs out. If you are the one kid who's distinct from that, you are being subjected to majority uh, tyranny. And I think we need to test back on that. And it seemed like part of your question was, how do you address that? And I think in addition to some of the things that Eric discussed, is to go after this in terms of time, place, and manner provisions. If they're distributing materials during the school hours, you can restrict how that's done. There's nothing in the Supreme Court ruling that stops us from doing that. And also to bring forward uh, countermanding uh, documents, whether it's from humanist or secular groups, and say, we're going to get the exact same type of treatment to test uh, this provision. Because really what they are about is majority tyranny. They want to have it for them and not for anybody else, and you need to push back on that. With all due respect, isn't it, aren't these clubs voluntary in their participation? No one's forcing anyone to do anything. Wouldn't the best alternative be to simply start more secular humanist clubs to compete with these? I, I don't see how you could say it's voluntary for a kindergartner. It's, it's not the kindergartner that's deciding it's a, whether the they go. It's the parent. So the is, is the child then, is the child if we just look at it strictly from the view of parental rights and the, the, 
the battle of religious views versus secular views, that we've totally excluded children from the discussion. And that's the biggest thing that irritates me about the debate, because the children are affected, and they're not supposed to just be pawns and vessels to carry somebody else's worldview. And, and I'll tell you this, as a former evangelical Christian, I'm tired. I'm tired of evangelicals looking at children as merely vessels to promote their worldview. I consider that selfish. I consider it a way to try to avoid dealing with reality. And so if they can promote, if they can just build a whole culture around them, especially with their children, that believes the same things that they believe, that they don't have to face the facts. And so they're harming the children. The children are the victims here. I, thanks. I also want to point out, uh, that's so true, that uh, you know, at every Good News Club training I attended, children were offered points and prizes and sometimes candy for recruiting their peers to the club. So what this does is it's not just affecting the children of the parents who sign their kids up. Children are explicitly told to go out and recruit their peers to the club. So what it's doing is, 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 is destroying the fabric of the community itself. And, uh, and that ends up destroying you know, community harmony, and it ends up destroying uh, public education. And look, it would be nice to believe that the harm to public education is an unintended consequence of their activity, but it's not. Um, there's a segment of the fundamentalist world that has never accepted public education as a legitimate enterprise to begin with. They think that you know, public education that's non-sectarian, that is neither favoring nor disfavoring any particular form of religion, they think that's hostile to their, um, to their religion because it fails to affirm them in their worldview. And so they would actually be happy to destroy public education altogether. Thank you, Thank you all for being here. Uh, my question is kind of related to what you were just talking about. I'm wondering if any of you could talk about what role the increasing prevalence of charter schools have played in this uh, rise of extreme indoctrination and maybe even the Good news clubs. Uh, thanks for asking the question about charters. I really don't cover the issues, uh, issue of charters or magnets in my book, but I do write extensively about the voucher movement. Um, you know what's really interesting is that there are all these organizations like uh, um, that are like the, uh, the Discovery Institute, which is a creationist institute. It's based up out in Seattle, and they're all you know, about promoting creationism. Well, guess what? They have this side uh, division of their, of their organization that's promoting the voucher movement. And uh, the same if you look at the Cornwall Alliance, which is another kind of science denialist uh, outfit. They also have a division of their organization that promotes vouchers. Um, folks like the uh, Alliance De ADF, it uh, used to be called the Alliance Defense Fund, now it's the Alliance Defending Freedom. They're you know, heavily behind the sort of pro the school choice movement. As I did more research into the you know, uh, voucher movement, I, felt, I, I found that um, it is a, lo a lot of it is driven by these religious outfits um, that are determined to destroy public schools and uh, funnel that uh, tax money, our tax money, to private religious schools. And if you, know, if you look at um, states like Florida or Louisiana where voucher programs have been expanded, a lot of that money is actually you know, funding schools that use Bob Jones University uh, curriculum or uh, a a Becca or these other textbooks that uh, promote creationism, uh, a kind of Christian nationalist version of American history that never was, um, and uh, have, are, are filled with religious bigotry. So, um, so that's a kind of a So would you say this, the same organizations that are involved in pushing for this Good News Club movement are also involved in these other strategies to undermine public education? This, uh, many of the same organizations that are backers of Good News Clubs, such as Liberty Council or some Alliance Defending Freedom, yes, they are. Uh, support what they call school choice, which is expanded uh, voucher opportunities. There's a difference, though. The charter schools are public schools. They are funded by public money directly to the school administration. With a voucher program, the money follows the student and then dissipates um, the money that is available for public education in your public school. The charter school, however, is because it is a federally funded and state funded public school must follow all of the federal regulations on education. 
So if you, we heard about one this morning, a charter school that has really, um, it's really a cloaked religious indoctrination school. That school is in violation of the charter policies. So if the people involved in that school wanted to do something about it, they could, because they're violating the, the, the regulations that go with charter schools. It's my impression that that's more common in charter schools than in public schools, that type of violation. Would you say that's true? It, it may be. Um, and in that case, your, your, um, your I want to say, classical um, academic public schools need to be watching that. Because yes, the charter schools tend to be formulated by parents who are very enthusiastic and feel that there's something defective with the public school. And in those instances, they're very often um, very energized uh, evangelical Christian families. But not always. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I agree with virtually everything that's been said tonight, you know, all about the politics of it and all the harm that's done. And to my, to my view, a uh, big part of the harm is mo mostly depriving children of the ability to learn more about the things that uh, Professor Dawkins would like them to learn. But uh, a lot of it has been on a kind of a general hypothetical level, and uh, while I agree with it, it would be more interesting to me to hear a personal, a personal view. Uh, when you were having the dialogue with Professor Dawkins, he asked you, did being in the club harm you? And you said, yes, it did. I would have liked if he had said, well, how did it personally harm you? If he had to ask that, what would you say? Well, this is a hard thing for me to say, but I'm going to say it because this is one of my motivations here. As a teenager, I had these subliminal messages of wanting to die running through. I didn't connect them until later as an adult, realizing exactly what the source was, because when you hear it, you just kind of suppress it it kind of goes down into the, the background. Um, but uh, when I went back and looked at the curriculum about three years ago um, and all of the severity, I realized that the reason I had such a terribly negative self-image and that I even attempted to take my own life as a preteen was because of these kinds of messages. So I was very personally harmed. And I know other people um, who uh, I grew up with who succeeded in taking their own lives. I don't know the specific reasons. I just know that they suffer the same kind of indoctrination. And so, no, I don't have statistics because people don't collect statistics on, on uh, why people take their lives um, and they don't connect it to religion. Uh, but I suspect that there is a tremendous amount of suffering out there. I mean, I just know that from personal experience. So my own personal experience tells me, yes, there's a tremendous amount of harm. And it makes sense because if you're telling children, for example, you know, you know one is, have you ever thought about how sinful you are? And another is, God knows what you're really like on the inside. He knows that deep down you are a sinner. You were born that way. Um, another one is, um, you deserve God's punishment, you deserve to die. Another one is you deserve death. Um, and other, other things talking about your, your sin and your deceitful heart. Um, no, you know, no wonder I developed such a terrible self-image. It hurt. Oh, thanks. That, that That's why I'm here, because I want to protect other children from that. I've got a quick question. Uh, when our country was founded, Protestants were actually one of the first ones that uh, suggested a separation of church and state because they didn't want their faith to suffer if some other faith were selected instead of theirs. Uh, all of you have in one way or another at least intimated uh, trying to get the grassroots to involve uh, more moderate religious groups in a separation of church and state. Uh, how likely or how realistic do you think it is to expect them to see their own interests met 
in a separation of church and state in as much as their religious views might not be the ones that are favored in the absence of that separation? Uh, I, in my experience uh, serving in the Maine legislature, there was a significant uh, organization, Inter Interfaith Alliance, and uh, they have chapters in most every state, and they are a conglomeration of progressive religious groups who do work on separation of church and state and are you know, effective and helpful. The reality is, numerically, that they were not as significant or had as much impact as the fundamentalist Protestant groups who were much more organized and well-funded. And frankly, I think it's almost, uh, that's looking at us in this room because the player that was not at the table, I served 10 years in politics, I was on judiciary committee, we had women's right to choose, we had the marriage issue, so you know, I was majority whip and I was on appropriation. So I had reason to be lobbied. The religious right, even up in Maine, was there active, working hard. Uh, I never once in 10 years had a single person come to me and say, please vote my way, I'm with some kind of secular group or organization. It didn't happen once. Whereas I think if we stepped up and organized ourselves with statewide conventions and activism, uh, then that would add and create a very valuable alliance with the interfaith uh, alliance. So. I think we can be successful and that over the next several years, I think we can really help turn the tide. Thank you. The question I have is being a parent, knowing what this organization does to children, how do you handle it when your children come up to you and say, mommy, daddy, my friends are in this, I wanna be part of this. How do you handle that? really good question. How do you handle it if your kids come up and they say, gosh, mommy, they're giving the Good News Club kids uh, Oreos and candy and chocolate chip cookies and balloons and cupcakes. You know, it's interesting. When the Good News Club came to our elementary school, I felt it was sort of like, I was telling a, a woman this morning, it was sort of like, it was sort of like, Gosh, I, it was sort of like I have to have the sex talk, but too early. It was sort of like, oh gosh, I really don't feel like she's like old enough for the religion talk, but I guess I have to, you know, have it with her. She was, you know, really young, and I had to teach her words like superstition. I had to teach her um, the definition of bigotry and bullying, and uh, and I really had to kind of prepare her for. I think when a good news club comes to a public school, parents do need to prepare their kids for the kind of bullying and faith-based bigotry that is inevitably going to um, uh, erupt on, on the playgrounds of their school. And I think it's very important to have those conversations as early as possible. Um, my daughter was, was ready for them. And, uh, you know, it's funny, a lot of people have said to me, you know, are you worried about your kids? I'm not worried about my kids. I'm worried about our culture. I'm worried about our society. And look, the separation of church and state is not uh, a principle that's just around for some atheists. or um, uh, It's really a principle that has served our country well since its founding. Um, and uh, I think one of the reasons we have such a, a vibrant religious life, it's such a diverse uh, religious life in our, in our country is because of that separation of church and state where we've had no state-sponsored form of religion no religion's been allowed to take over government institutions like public schools. And that, um, you know, leaves feel, people kind of free to, 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 to uh, you know, create the kind of diverse religious environment that we have today. Um, and it's also, I, it's interesting, I see the rise of, of secularism in our cult, uh, culture as, as a reaction to the kind of uh, fundamentalism that is also on the rise I think as more people start to associate religion with um, aggressive uh, or obnoxious politics, uh, more people are willing to stand up and say, no, this is wrong, and, and to think about what they actually do believe and say, you know what, I, I am actually not a believer. Thank you. How, how does decreasing a child's sense of self-esteem help the evangelical Christian movement. 
Well, I, I think it's true with a lot of fundamentalist religions. You teach um, the people that they are um, very inadequate the way they are. And the more inadequate you make them feel, the more likely you can sell your cure to them. So I, I think that's the dynamic that goes on. It's a, decon it's a deconstruction of the personality. And once the personality is deconstructed, then you build it back up. And it's a technique that is used um, in torture. It's a technique that is used in basic training in the military. It's a technique that is used at any time where you really want to change at the very core level who the person is. And so that's, that's why it works so I mean, it works really well, and that's why they do it. Did that answer your question? Um, I was wondering, it seems that it's, it's very easy to debunk and say that we shouldn't have these kinds of clubs in schools because obviously they're harmful to children because of the message that they send, the very extreme, you deserve to die. I was wondering, where do you draw the line in a school-related but not necessarily sponsored religious program? Is it okay for kids to talk about it after school? And kind of a second part of that question, is if you don't draw the line, what would you say to somebody who's not necessarily in a affluent California community where you can, instead of putting your child in a religious club, put them in a soccer club, what would you say to someone on the south side of Chicago whose child might only have the option of going to a religious club as opposed to being on the streets after school? Um, so, th wait, there are two questions there. <laughs> And I'm going to um, answer the second first. Uh, uh, it's true that uh, Good News Clubs uh, often establish uh, in poor communities. I heard many Good News Club leaders say I would rather start a Good News Club in a poor community because parents don't question what's being taught. They're just grateful for the free aftercare. Um, I don't think that enhances the, look, schools are about teaching, school, public schools should be about education. They should be about um, teaching children skills and facts, and I think a religious uh, activity in the public schools, like a Good News Club, degrades the educational mission, uh, degrades the mission of that public school, and I don't think it enhances, enhances that, that, that there's these children's lives for that very reason. Um, um, so, uh, does it make those children's lives better? I don't think so. Um, and I'm not sure, I can't remember well, your second question. I, maybe I could or Sean could address the first question. And the, que and the first question was, where do you draw the line? And that's always a very difficult issue in, in law because things are fuzzy, things aren't always black and white. In fact, they usually aren't black and white. But as a practical matter, um, uh, you probably draw the line where the culture will sustain it because certainly the Good News Club stuff goes way beyond the line and I don't think most judges would want to defend it. Um, if they moderated it uh, sufficiently, it might make it a closer question on some of these grounds uh, th uh, that we proposed. But, um, uh, but uh, the culture also evolves. So, uh, you know, frankly, uh, you have, I, I mean, for example, there's a 1996 case uh, about distributing literature in public schools, and the, and the court there held a public elementary school can shield its 5 through 13-year-olds from topics and viewpoints that could harm their emotional, moral, social, and intellectual development. Now, that's not really precise. Uh, it covers a lot, a lot of things, but it, you know, it goes on and says you could intercept racially and religiously bigoted materials before they damage the children. Um, you could tr protect children from materials that could severely traumatize a child. Again, this is a court opinion that doesn't draw really super clear lines. Um, but you can't expect to be able to always draw uh, precise lines. You have to, uh, you know, part of it's a public relations battle. and bringing this message out to the public. And to some extent, some of the legal issues may shrink away because if 
there's a cultural firestorm over what the Good News Club is doing, they may just leave. I mean, people don't like conflict, usually. And so uh, they may retreat from that environment. You mentioned about, it seemed like you were focusing upon low income situations or people where there's not as, uh, not as much opportunity as in other locations. And I think that is an important uh, issue. Uh, certainly, I've written about in African American communities and urban areas, uh, for instance, in Washington, D.C., you mentioned Southside Chicago. In Washington, D.C., there's uh, some of these voucher schools where literally tax money is going to a school that says you are soldiers for Christ. And you know, I've spoken to African American people who say it is unique in the respect that, uh, uh, unlike the fundamentalist Protestant right that's aligned in all these different ways, that even though African American culture is largely, you know, politically it's more on the Democratic side of the aisle, but that if you are an African American in some of these communities, you feel uniquely isolated if your interest is in secularism or science uh, topics, and so it makes it tough. And that's why I think one of the things the Dawkins Foundation is really working on is fostering, and, and one of the beauties of the uh, social media is that we would have a subpage as we're starting with Spanish language page to have one for African American humanists and atheists so they can address those issues. And I think we need to really add to that outreach, because I think your point is really um, unfortunately well taken that it is tougher in, in a lower income situation sometimes where that's the only game in town, if you will, and we need to work with the African American humanist and atheist community to make sure there, there's an alternate available. Thank you guys so much for doing this, I really appreciate it. And it's kind of cool that I got to be one of the last ones uh, to step up because my question kind of mirrors what Lamont said when he stepped up here right at the beginning. And uh, you do have a situation where what they're telling these kids is so image rich and it's so powerful and wonderful. Um, it was crazy to me because when I was five years old, I said to my mom, mommy, I don't want to have a black heart no more. And I don't want to have a black heart no more. That's what I, it was the black heart imagery that got me. So in, in that situation, yeah, that, that is what kind of brought me down and made me sad. But in, I can guess what was in the second envelope that you didn't mention was you pull it out and it's the gift of life. And so you do have this wonderfully powerful redemptive thing. So, so my question for you guys, and if there's not an answer, that's, that's awesome. I, I hope you guys can find one, is what is the bait, the great wonderfulness that you guys are using to get people here? Because your arguments are sharp. I mean, it's shiny, it's a great hook. But a lot of us came here because the bait <laughs> was right there at the top of it. And we were like, oh my god, Richard Dawkins is giving me color space, what? <laughs> and so we came, but we got to hear what this is. So my question for you is this, when, when you tell someone about what you're doing, how can you get them to not say, oh, that's awful, but for them to go, oh, that's awesome? How can you get them to do that with your same message? I, I think it is awesome. You're talking about reason and science and what it's accomplished versus what religion has accomplished over the last couple of uh, millennia? Yeah. <laughs> uh, any day of the week, you see what science does that transforms lives for the better. And I would add, because a lot of times I think it's reason and science and that science obviously does fantastic things to help others, and as Richard Dawkins often says, it should be science for itself, that you just want to know, and that's the beauty of doing it in addition to the utility. But I would add that reason, we should not be shy to say, just as you would apply an evidence-based process to a scientific experiment, sorry, politicians, sorry, members of the school board, we actually believe and think it's so beautifully effective to apply an evidence-based approach to policy. And I, I think it's the best thing that the human race has ever come up with, and we should be proud to celebrate it. 